All right, I'm going to talk about <coughs> simulating quantum field theory. It's something I've worked on for a few years with Stephen Jordan and Keith Lee. And I know you, you thought you were going to have lunch now, and instead uh, you, you're having me for lunch. So also this is the last talk, and it's Saturday. So I'm not going to um, try to tell you uh, very technical things. I want to give you an idea of why we think this problem is interesting, what's been done so far, what we hope to do. Um, so why do we care about simulating quantum field theory on a quantum computer? It's because quantum field theory is really the basis underlying almost everything in physics, a possible exception being quantum gravity. But everything else we know about the fundamental interactions and all the physics built on that, including atomic physics and condensed matter physics, is founded on quantum field theory. So this is really in part motivated by uh, the big question about the quantum church uh, Turing thesis. Is it true that anything that occurs in nature can be efficiently simulated with a general purpose universal quantum computer? And the question is one of those fortunate ones in which either the yes answer or the no answer would be exciting. So if the answer is yes, then it means that with a quantum computer we should be able to simulate any process that can occur in the physical world. Something that we don't think is possible with ordinary classical digital computers. So that's an important application and we can imagine that in the future, when we have large-scale quantum computers, they will be used by physicists and also chemists and engineers um, to study such problems. If the answer is no, uh, I guess from a fundamental physics point of view, that is the exciting answer. It means that there are processes in nature that we can simulate with the model of quantum computation we're currently using. In some sense, the computational resources that nature allows have not been fully captured by the model of universal quantum computers we're currently using. And so even more powerful computation may be allowed by the laws of physics. Now I'm really talking about digital quantum simulation. That is, simulations that we could do in the future if we have scalable, fault-tolerant quantum computers. I make the distinction between digital and analog quantum simulation. Analog quantum simulation is a very active area currently, both theoretically and experimentally. Many people are using cold systems of atoms and optical lattices, systems of molecules, ion traps. Um, that can be customized so that we can adjust uh, with knobs that we have control of in the laboratory, the interactions among the particles, and so study different types of local Hamiltonians and do experiments to observe the properties of the system. Um, that theme is limited by the imperfect control that people have over those systems. So actually there are interesting complexity theoretic questions about are such simulations really giving us information about a problem which is classically computationally hard, which I think are open questions. But anyway, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm going to imagine that I have a quantum computer that can do logical gates on logical qubits with whatever accuracy I need, as we envision will be the case when we use the principles of fault tolerance in scalable quantum computers of the future. So a digital quantum simulation really has uh, three steps. There's a state preparation 
that we do to get things started. That is, in our quantum computer, preparing some quantum state which describes the ideal system that we want to simulate. And then we simulate the Schrodinger evolution with uh, some local Hamiltonian. I'll just say, well, I'll write e to the minus i h t, meaning a time evolution operator, though I don't necessarily want to restrict my attention to a time independent Hamiltonian. It might actually be a time dependent Hamiltonian. And then we perform some kind of simulated measurement of something which is computationally uh, reasonable, like measuring some uh, local observable. And the task we're trying to perform is to sample with reasonable accuracy from the probability distribution of outcomes of that final measurement. Maybe with some error, but with some uh, sufficiently small error. And we're interested in how do the resources scale with various things like the error. If we have a good simulation, we desire that the resources that we need will scale reasonably, polynomially, with the error, with things like uh, the total system size, and also with the energy of the process. So what I mean by resources, of course, are essentially space and time. We're interested in the number of qubits we need to do the simulation, and the number of gates. And we hope they will scale polynomially with uh, 1 over epsilon, where epsilon is some measure of the error, and uh, things like uh, the particle number uh, the total energy of the process and maybe other uh, physical measures. Um, so you might say, isn't this really a solved problem? I'm not sure whether it's been discussed in the boot camp, but already in the 1990s, uh, Seth Lloyd and others discussed how we can simulate a local Hamiltonian. Uh, we have a Hamiltonian, which can be written as a sum of terms, uh, each of which is k-local, say, acting collectively non-trivially on at most k qubits and has a norm, let's say an operator norm, uh, bounded above by some constant. And then at least for the evolution part of the problem, uh, the claim is that there's some uh, simulated unitary evolution operator. We want it to be close to the ideal evolution that we're trying to simulate governed by this Hamiltonian. So in some norm, let's say the operator norm, we want this to be uh, less than epsilon. And we can take that to be a measure of the error. And you know it's a known result for a while uh, that this can be done with a number of gates, which is polynomial in a 1 over epsilon and in what I'll call omega, which is if we're thinking of a geometrically local Hamiltonian, is the space-time volume that we're trying to simulate. So it's volume times time. Um, so why isn't the problem solved? Well, for one thing, we're interested in Hamiltonians, which are, uh, in some sense, local, but for which it's not necessarily the case that the terms uh, in the Hamiltonian have a bounded norm. So they're local now, not in the sense of nece uh, necessarily acting on some bounded number of qubits, but rather we have some other decomposition into degrees of freedom. Each one acts on some uh, bounded number of degrees of freedom, but the Hamiltonian may have terms which are infinite norm. But the more fundamental problem really is that even if we're trying to simulate a finite spatial volume, the Hamiltonian is an infinite sum. There's a number of degrees of freedom per unit volume, which is infinite. 
So we have a system with the number of qubits uh, per volume, which is infinite. What's characteristic of quantum field theory is that there are degrees of freedom at arbitrarily short wavelength. So that if I have a thimble full of space that I'm trying to simulate, I mean, do people still speak about thimbles when they want to talk about something small? I guess you have to. Have, I, I took sewing class in seventh grade, so I remember <laughs> thimbles. Um, a little thing, a little volume, and try to simulate it. Well, the thing is that there are really an infinite number of degrees of freedom in there because you have to consider arbitrarily short wavelengths. And if we needed to simulate accurately all of those degrees of freedom, it would be, it would be hopeless. Even simulating a finite volume would require infinite resources. Um, but the good news is that corresponding to shorter and shorter wavelengths are higher and higher energy. So although all those degrees of freedom are in some sense there, we have to include energy in our resource accounting. And if we consider a bounded energy, we won't really have to simulate with very good accuracy the extremely short distance physics because those degrees of freedom are going to be very unlikely to get excited. So the idea is the short wavelengths I don't have to be accurately simulated. if we have some bounded energy. And that's going to make our task possible. And actually, this is, this is a really important principle, not just for the purpose of trying to do a computer simulation of the system. It, you could say, in some sense, it, it's the most important idea in all of physics, that if we want to understand physics at long distances, let's say at the scale of a hydrogen atom, we don't have to get right all the microscopic details of quantum gravity at a scale of 10 to the minus 35 meters. And we don't have to know all about that short distance physics to understand the long distance physics. Um, and you know, if it weren't for that, physics wouldn't be possible. We could, we could never understand the Bohr atom without doing quantum gravity. How would we get started? But we really can uh, decompose the world kind of scale by scale and understand one scale at a time. That's how physics has progressed. And we use the same principle in trying to simulate this system. We can study its low energy physics without simulating its very short distance physics with good accuracy. So this is, this is a good news, bad news thing. It means, like I said, that we can do atomic physics without understanding physics at the Planck scale. It also means that it's really hard, say, by doing experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, or maybe we can explore physics at the 10 to the minus 19 meter scale. It's going to be pretty hard to learn about physics at the Planck scale, which is uh, 10 to the minus 35 meters, because the physics at the low energies is not very sensitive at all to the physics at very short distances. Um, now, beyond quantum field theory, uh, things get interesting in a way. Uh, ultimately, we'd like to be able to think about simulating processes in which quantum fluctuations in space-time are important, quantum gravity. And then uh, we won't necessarily have a geometrically local Hamiltonian to talk about. In fact, the whole concept of space-time may be, in some sense, an emergent concept for some more fundamental underlying theory, but uh, it still may be reasonable to hope that we can think of the Hamiltonian of being k-local, not necessarily geometrically local in some dimension, but having a Hamiltonian that can be decomposed into pieces, which each of which act on a bounded number of degrees of freedom. And then a simulation may still be feasible, even with a general purpose quantum computer. Okay. So I'm going to talk about relativistic quantum field theories. I mean, it's, it's also interesting to talk about uh, non-relativistic ones, but relativistic 
theories are the ones that we use in particle physics. They're in some sense the most fundamental because we think that you know, Lorentz invariance is a fundamental feature of space-time. And so on a quantum computer, what we're going to do is choose a Hamiltonian and try to simulate the evolution described by the Hamiltonian, which means we have to do something which is kind of disgusting from the point of view of the relativistically invariant theory. We have to pick a reference frame, pick a particular way of defining time, and then evolve using a Hamiltonian appropriate for that way of slicing up the space-time into time slices. And some other observer might prefer to slice up space-time in a different way and would use maybe a different Hamiltonian. But it doesn't matter because if they compare their answers for questions when the answers can be formulated in a way that doesn't depend on the reference frame, they'll agree with one another. So we just pick some particular frame and describe the Hamiltonian evolution in that frame. Um, now, how do we formulate the theory? The observables are fields, so they're functions of space-time. Um, so I'm going to write phi of x and pi of x, which are a field and its conjugate momentum. So here, x represents a coordinate of a point in space. I'm going to use little d to denote the dimension of space. And so for each uh, value of the real coordinates of a point in space-time, there's a corresponding operator. And all the phi of x's are mutually commuting for different values of x, or the same value of x, they commute with themselves. So if I consider at some fixed time the commutator of phi of x with phi of y, it's zero, so they can all be simultaneously diagonalized. And there are also conjugate momenta, which are mutually commuting, one for each spatial point. But the phi's and the pi's have a non-trivial commutation relation that's equal to i times a d-dimensional delta function of the difference. Uh, I'm using units in which h bar and c have been conveniently set equal to 1. And so this is just like the canonical commutation relations for a particle and a potential, a commutator of a position and a momentum. Uh, but now we have this formally infinite number of p's and q's, which we have a field for each point in space. And the Hamiltonian that we'll consider can be written as an integral over d-dimensional space of a polynomial in the fields, a square of the field momentum, plus a square, let's put in a factor of one-half here, I guess, uh, plus uh, a square with a coefficient. Well, actually, I want to put in the gradients of the fields, the gradients of the fields. Uh, squared uh, plus some parameter with the dimensions of mass, phi squared, and then plus a parameter I'll call lambda, fourth power of phi. And that's going to be the Hamiltonian I'd like to consider. Uh, M0 squared is called uh, the bare mass because we want to emphasize that it doesn't necessarily correspond to the physical masses of particles described by the theory. And if we didn't have this last term, the quartic term, uh, then this would be a very simple theory to solve. It would be what we call a Gaussian theory, a free field theory, and we essentially can calculate everything we want to know about it analytically. So what makes the problem interesting is this term. What it corresponds to, when, once we quantize the theory, the theory describes particles. And if we didn't have the nonlinear uh, term or the non-quadratic term in the Hamiltonian, then the particles would just be non-interacting, so it would become essentially a one-particle theory. What makes it an interesting many-particle theory is that uh, this term describes particle collisions, so two particles, when they occupy the same point in space-time, interact in a non-trivial way, and that's what makes the problem potentially hard and interesting to simulate. So just to make sure the notation is clear, if I wanted to, I could write down 
away function for the system, and I could expand it in terms of some basis, and as a basis, I can choose a complete set of commuting operators like the fields themselves. And so I could expand uh, the way function as a functional integral over all uh, functions of space, some amplitude, and a state phi. Sorry, the notation's a little bit schematic, but this means a simultaneous eigenstate of all the phi of x's, of which there are continuously, you know, varying infinite number. And that's a basis for the Hilbert space. We can expand any state in terms of it. So just uh, since I suppose not all of you are, are physicists, I'll give you a history lesson. So quantum field theory um, has its origins in the 1920s, not long after quantum mechanics was developed. Those were the days when giants roamed the Earth, uh, great physicists uh, were at work, uh, Dirac, Heisenberg, Pauli, Born, and Jordan were all founders of quantum field theory around 1927. And one of the things they did right away is they realized, uh, well, you could take the, the free part of the theory, they were thinking of the electromagnetic field at the time, and you can quantize that and understand everything about it, and what it describes is photons, particles of light, and that provided kind of a fundamental point of view on the light quantum hypothesis, which had been proposed 22 years earlier by Einstein. But then confusion reigned for about 20 years, because people started using quantum field theory to compute things, and you could compute in a perturbation expansion in this parameter, and that worked really well in electrodynamics. If you computed just to the first non-trivial order of perturbation theory, the leading <laughs> term in a power series expansion in the coupling constant, but when you try to go beyond that leading order of perturbation theory, it blew up in your face and gave infinite answers, which caused great consternation and confusion and led people to suggest there's something wrong with quantum mechanics or there's something wrong with this formalism of quantum field theory, and it got straightened out conceptually in the late 40s by uh, Feynman, Tamanaga, Schwinger, Dyson, and what they realized is you have to be very sure that you're thinking about the theory in operational terms. If you want to use this theory to compute some physical process that can be an observed in an experiment, the calculations you should do should relate different quantities which can be observed in the experiment. It would be wrong, uh, these people said, to just try to compute, say, electron-electron scattering, the probability or cross-section for electron-electron scattering, in terms of the parameters of Hamiltonian, if those parameters can't be directly observed in the experiment. What we should do instead is express the answer for electron-electron scattering in terms of other directly experimentally measurable quantities, like the mass of the electron and the charge of the electron. And when you did that properly, it works, and you really get sensible answers to sensible physical questions. These infinities drop out. Although it was a non-trivial combinatorial task performed mostly by Dyson to show that that really worked. And then there was a period in the 50s which I, am, I guess I won't tell you about the details of this part because I'm already, uh, I'm burning time uh, at an astonishing rate. Um, but where people started to worry about what, uh, what is a quantum field theory from some sort of mathematically rigorous point of view. Whiteman in the mid-50s formulated a set of axioms which became by consensus what a quantum field theory was and then uh, that gave rise to the challenge, can we mathematically really construct one in some you know, mathematically well-defined way, show that quantum field theory exists? And, um, well, you know, that is still, from a mathematician's point of view, an unfinished program. But the key insight that I think answered to the satisfaction of most physicists what is a quantum field theory came from Ken Wilson, 
in the 1960s, a great physicist, just passed away this uh, a few months ago. Um, and it's very interesting how this happened, because Wilson was rather unusual back in the 60s among physicists, because he was very interested in computation, and he really knew a lot about computers and code. And he started to ask himself, suppose I wanted to do quantum field theory on a computer. How would I do that? How would I set up the problem? And of course, he realized that as, not that you know, this was a great insight, but as with any attempt to put a continuous medium on a computer, you've got to digitize it, so you'll have to somehow uh, approximate the system by one with a, a finite number of degrees of freedom. So we'd like to put our theory on a lattice in space with some lattice spacing. <coughs> so what I wrote formally as an integral we should really think of as being a sum over the sites of some lattice and now there's a field variable living at each one of the sites. And if we want to describe, what we really want to describe though is the quote unquote continuum limit of the theory in which we can remove this short distance cutoff. So we want to take the limit of A going to zero. And how do you do that exactly? And, and Wilson kind of turned this on its head and he said, well, really we should think about it this way. We have some fixed lattice. And what we're interested in is for the physics that we want to study becoming very long distance in units of the lattice spacing. So what we want to study is, uh, in particular, if in, in the units I'm using, a mass is the same thing as an inverse length. So if the particles have masses, uh, we want their inverse masses uh, to uh, get much larger than uh, the lattice spacing. We want all the energy scales to get much larger than the lattice spacing. And really, so this so-called continuum limit is what a condensed matter physicist would call a second-order phase transition. It means the correlation length of the problem in all the relevant physics is becoming arbitrarily long distance compared to the fixed lattice spacing. And uh, what, what makes this a very powerful observation, which is what Wilson realized, is that for the purpose of describing that very long distance physics, you don't need to know much about the microscopic theory. The mi it's this same idea that I mentioned before, really, about the short distance physics uh, not being necessary to simulate it in detail, but this is really Wilson's key idea. This Hamiltonian might be very complicated. It might have lots of other parameters that I didn't write down. But for the purpose of calculating physics at very long distances, compared to the lattice spacing, we don't need to know all those microscopic details. Everything we need to know can be encoded in just a small number of parameters. And that was really the right way of looking at what we call renormalizability, how we can make sense of the theory when the lattice spacing is very small compared to physical length scales. And incidentally, Wilson had another uh, question. Sounds as if you're saying, well, you know, there was a discretization issue, and why did you take care of the discretization issue? But everything works out fine, which is what we at uh, in computer science, when we have to do in green space, and, you know, this is what we do, and we never expect there to be issues with discretization. So, can you say something about why it would not have worked out? Like, what would it be worried? Well, what the worry would have been that even when you go to long distances, there are still an indefinite number of parameters from the short distance theory which govern what the long distance physics is like. It can happen, yeah, it can happen. So that's really the difference between what we mean by a renormalizable theory and a non-renormalizable theory. In the case of the non-renormalizable theories, the uh, physics at long distances can be sensitive to the very short distance physics. Well, um, but, but Wilson, I mean, Wilson looked at this the right way, which is the way you're looking at it, so that the answer is obvious. Because before people were trying to, you know, understand, here's the theory, and now let's try to go to higher and higher and higher energies and see how the very high energy processes depend on the parameters of the theory. And that's, that's how they encountered all these infinities. And what the infinities were signaling is that if the theory isn't renormalizable, 
you need more and more and more free parameters to calculate to higher and higher and higher accuracy. But if you look at, the, at it the right way, which is that you're really looking at the very long distance limit of some fixed theory, it's easier to understand why only a small number of parameters would remain relevant for making the low energy predictions. Okay. Sorry, can I ask just a semantic yeah. question, which is, when you say theory, what is, does that have a precise meaning? Theory has a precise meaning. It means, um, in the context of this discussion, a particular Hamiltonian. Yeah, so we have, you know, a standard model for particle physics. You can think of that as just the Hamiltonian that we think really describes the physics of the world. It's a theory. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess I was going to say Wilson's other great idea. You could call it the ten billion dollar idea, uh, which is that. Uh, yeah, it's true, there are just a few parameters that you have to keep to describe the low energy physics, but this condition that the mass of the theory is small in units of one over the lattice spacing is really unstable. You have to tune the Hamiltonian very carefully to realize that condition. This isn't any surprise to condensed matter physicists. It means that when there's a second order phase transition, it only occurs when you tune the parameters just right. Um, it's, um, you know, co-dimension one, say, in some space of parameters. Um, but it means you have to tune the microscopic theory very well to get this condition that the mass is small in units of one over the last spacing. And uh, that fine-tuning, from a fundamental point of view, seems very disgusting. And so it led to the expectation that when the Large Hadron Collider turned on, we'd find new physics. Because, according to the standard model, there is a scalar field described by Hamiltonian kind of like this. There's other stuff in the standard model as well. That's the Higgs field. There's a corresponding particle, the Higgs boson. We know that Higgs boson can't be extremely heavy, and so that means somebody kind of fine-tuned the Hamiltonian to keep the Higgs boson light. And so the expectation was there had to be some more fundamental reason why the Higgs boson turned out to be light. And so there were proposals about what kinds of new physics would make that natural, all of which seemed to suggest there'd be new particles that would be discovered at the Large Hadron Collider. So where are they? It's a little bit disturbing that they haven't been seen. And uh, maybe, uh, well, we're not quite sure what that's telling us. Maybe this whole idea of uh, naturalness that uh, we shouldn't have to fine-tune to get nature to be the way she is. Uh, maybe it's a misguided idea. And nature does do some fine-tuning. It's kind of a mystery. Of course, there's another even more famous fine-tuning, which is the dark energy. Um, the energy in the vacuum is non-zero. It's extremely small. Nobody knows why it should be so small. It seems to involve tuning. Nobody understands that either. All right, but I'm supposed to be talking about a quantum algorithm. Um, okay, I'm getting there. Um, well, let me tell you what it is in our papers which have appeared so far uh, that we simulated. Well, I already told you. We simulated this theory. Uh, we simulated it, or we didn't really because we don't have a quantum computer. We described an algorithm for simulating it if we had a quantum computer. In uh, spatial, I'm going to sometimes use uh, capital D, since that's what I'm used to, um, which is the space-time dimension, the spatial dimension of plus one. And we described how you would simulate this uh, lambda phi four theory, a theory with this type of uh, interaction in uh, two, three, and four-dimensional space-time. And incidentally, when it comes to taking this limit of going to the continuum or moving the lattice spacing, there, there's an important thing uh, everybody should know, and that is that in more than four space-time dimensions, the limit uh, seems to be trivial. When you look at the physics, in other words, at very long distances compared, to the lattice spacing, uh, the interaction goes away. 
And so you really, it really just becomes a theory of free particles. So for this type of quantum field theory, it becomes extremely boring in more than four space-time dimensions. For d equals four, um, it's kind of a marginal case where, uh, well, the same thing probably happens. This we can make mathematically rigorous, that it really becomes a free theory in more than four dimensions. In four dimensions, it probably becomes a free theory, though I don't think there's a completely uh, a complete mathematical proof of that from first principles, uh, but the interactions kind of turn off very slowly as you go to longer and longer distances. But you get interesting continuum limits in two or three space-time dimensions, and so it may not be a coincidence that there's something of a critical importance in quantum field theory about four space-time dimensions, and we live in four space-time dimensions. Um, Okay, so what is the algorithm supposed to do? Well, um... Of course, you could have written down phi cube theory. Uh, sorry? You could have written down phi cube theory. And we don't yeah. Six inches. Well, phi cube theory, um, we think, uh, you know, doesn't have a Hamiltonian which is bounded from below, although it does, uh, it doesn't give, uh, have the same problems with uh, the infrared flow. Probably didn't want to erase my Hamiltonian, but that's okay. Right, so I, I'm not, not sure I quite understood what you meant by d equal to, for d equal to four. Are you saying the computational problem might be easier? Or? Yeah, I'm saying that if you really wanted to simulate the um, Hamiltonian evolution in the continuum limit, it, simulate the evolution of states when the relevant physics is all at arbitrarily long length scales compared to the lattice spacing, it becomes a very easy problem in more than four space-time dimensions because it's just free field theory. And we know how to do that. It's a Gaussian theory. Okay? And so the problem is that these interactions um, no longer do anything at very long distances. Actually, it's kind of a nice way of thinking about that. Well, I don't think I have time to explain it, but it's, it's a true fact. Okay, so one way we could... Um, describe what we're trying to do is we, uh, I already sort of said this, we create the vacuum. Actually, I think I'm going to skip this part. Let me just make one comment. Um, you know, I should have made it before. I said, okay, quantum simulation means we prepare a state, we evolve, and then we measure. But of course, the preparation can be hard. We know, it was the subject of the previous talk, that finding the ground state of a Hamiltonian can be a QMA hard problem. And um, so then we're talking about state preparations, which we really don't expect to be able to do on our quantum computer with reasonable resources. But, but as physicists, you know, we're not worried about that, because the lesson of QMA hardness is that there are certain state preparations that nature can't do because they're too hard. So you know, uh, people who think about spin glasses have been aware of this for decades, that if a spin glass at low temperature were able to relax to thermal equilibrium, it would have to solve an NP-hard problem. And so what does it mean? It means that it can't relax to equilibrium because we don't think it can solve such problems. So the states that we care about, if our goal is to simulate nature, are the states that can be efficiently prepared on a general purpose quantum computer. That's what we think uh, are the state preparation problems that nature solves. Um, but I was going to say something about why I think the problem that we're solving is BQP hard. But let me skip that and just tell you what, um, what we did. So um, kind of obvious that it's BQP hard, right? Because we should be able to encode a quantum circuit using the field theory. But um, I'm not going to describe that. So we can think of the problem as being presented this way. We have an input. 
uh, which is some list of particle momenta. And uh, what we want to output, this is a list of incoming particle momentum particles which are going to collide. And we want to output a list of outgoing particle momentum. Particle momentum. And what we're trying to do is to sample with reasonable accuracy from the probability distribution of states that we can get. This is uh, the S matrix. It's meant to describe what happens asymptotically when you bang some particles together. Let's say I have two incoming particles with a lot of energy. They collide. We want to simulate this collision. It will, in general, in a relativistic theory, uh, many particles can be created if it's kinematically possible. So we expect there to be a lot of uh, relatively soft particles. Soft meaning they carry some small fraction of the incoming total energy. And we would like to simulate the different possible final states. Uh, the probability distribution of final states with some small error. Um, and um, this is particularly why do we, well, I'll just make a comment about why we think it's hard. Um, in the case where we're in less than uh, four um, spatial dimensions, if we try to analyze this perturbatively in our coupling constant, uh, we'd really be doing an expansion in lambda uh, over m to the 4 minus d. Lambda is the coupling, m is the uh, physical mass of the particles. If this is of order 1, then we say that the theory is, has strong coupling. It means that if we did try to analyze the theory in a power series expansion in lambda, it would converge very badly. In fact, even if we could sum up the perturbation theory to all orders, we don't think it gives the exact answer. There are uh, contributions which um, go like e to the minus order 1 over lambda that don't show up in any order of the perturbation expansion. And although we have you know, methods like Feynman diagram methods and well, more recent uh, sexier methods for doing perturbation theory, uh, first of all, it doesn't give the exact answer. And secondly, even if we did try to compute to some high order of perturbation theory, uh, we don't know how to do that efficiently because summing up all the terms uh, has a complexity that scales badly with the order of perturbation theory. It's actually worse than exponential. It's like factorial growth. So we don't know how to do um, a perturbative study of this type of process and, well, I think we can uh, make an argument, though we have not actually worked that out in all its details, that it's BQP hard because we can simulate a quantum circuit uh, using the quantum field theory. So the procedure that uh, we analyzed, um, or at least one of the procedures that we analyzed goes like this. So we start out by preparing uh, the vacuum of the, of the free field theory. I'll use FF for free field. The ground state of the theory when lambda is zero. But we're interested in the interacting theory. So we have to turn on the coupling. But first we prepare wave packets of the free theory. So now we have some wave packets with pretty well-defined momentum. We can't define the momentum exactly precisely because these wave packets have some finite spatial spread. But they're narrow in momentum space. They're about to bump into one another. Of course, in the free theory, they just pass through one another because the particles don't interact. But then we adiabatically turn on. Turn 
turn on the coupling. So as we do so, the idea is that we transform the particles of the free theory to what physicists sometimes call the dressed particles of the interacting theory. And then once we have the interaction turned on, we can evolve using the Hamiltonian for some finite amount of time until we're ready to read out the results of the collision. And one way we can do that is to again do an adiabatic now turn off of the interaction sending lambda t slowly back down to zero and then finally read out uh, measure the field modes to uh, find the momenta in the final states and so the question is what are the sources of error and what can we say about how big they are which one dominates actually depends on uh, what particular problem we study, like for example, in what spatial dimension we want to simulate the scalar field theory. But some of the sources of error we have to worry about are the lattice spacing, the fact that it's not really zero, or in other words, we're not considering physical processes at arbitrarily long distance and lattice units. We can only simulate a finite spatial volume. We have to digitize the fields, at least that's the way we chose to encode the problem. So phi of x is really formally a real value variable, but we give it a certain number of bits of precision, and we justify that using the finite total energy of the process, so we have to estimate how big an error we're making thereby. When we simulate the time evolution, as always, we introduce some finite step and do a Trotter approximation, so there's an error due to the Trotter step size. And then there's also what I'll call the uh, diabetic error, that is the deviation from a perfect adiabaticity as we turn the interaction on and off. And so, for example, just to give you an idea, You don't necessarily have to turn it off, but that's one possible way of doing the readout. And we've actually also analyzed another way in which we um, simulate a particle detector, which you know measures the amount of energy and momentum deposited in a cell, just kind of like modeling what an experimental physicist would do in a scattering experiment. And that, that's another way of uh, sampling from the final states. I mean, I to my understanding, the reason you turn it on is because you want to evolve yeah. you know, this easily prepared ground state. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so, it, but what I'm interested in is, you know, the particles separ separate from one another. And there's going to be some finite number of particles. You know, I, I, there's something important that I guess I didn't mention, which is, well, I sort of mentioned it. May, well, not really. That I'm going to consider a finite mass gap. So I want to consider m strictly uh, greater than zero. So with some total amount of energy, you know, there's some finite number of particles which were kinematically allowed to produce, and I'd like to read out what are the particles in the final state. So one way to do that is to uh, turn off the coupling, and then I know exactly how to measure in each mode whether there's a particle there or not. Otherwise, I would have to you know, find some other way of diagnosing what particles are in the final state. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, suppose we're doing the case where we have two spatial dimensions or three space-time dimensions. That's one of the interesting cases. It turns out if I'm interested in the scaling with the error, what uh, turns out to dominate it is the step of preparing the free field vacuum. That's just a preparation of a Gaussian state, so it just means doing 
some uh, matrix arithmetic. Um, if the state is Gaussian, it means that if we know its covariance matrix, which is the expectation value in the vacuum of a product of two of the field variables, that completely characterizes the state. In free field theory, we know what this covariance is, and we just have to construct the correspond corresponding Gaussian state. There's an algorithm for constructing Gaussian states on a quantum computer. The most efficient one that I know is due to Kataev and Webb. But it really just uh, requires that we multiply some matrices together using our quantum computer. Uh, and uh, well, I won't explain the details of that, but because it's limited by how fast we can do matrix multiplication, its complexity asymptotically scales like the best currently known algorithms for doing matrix arithmetic. And so neglecting algorithms, uh, sorry, neglecting logarithms, I get those words mixed up a lot. <laughs> neglecting logarithms, uh, it goes like the number of qubits, which I'm denoting whatever this letter is, uh, script E, uh, to the uh, 2.373. That comes from the complexity of doing matrix arithmetic. And uh, this is the number of qubits in our quantum computer. It goes like the physical volume, um, the volume that we're trying to simulate, in lattice units, so divided by a to the little d, uh, a the lattice spacing, d the spatial dimensionality. And so now I want to um, get a sufficiently small error. Getting a small error means that the lattice spacing has to be small in physical units. So we have to figure out how the error scales with the lattice spacing. And the answer is that uh, the error goes like a power of the lattice spacing. It, it goes like lattice spacing squared. And so those are corrections to, that arise from the fact that we should be studying the theory in continuous space, but we're studying it on the lattice instead. And so this error scales um, in the case of, this is uh, d equals 2. Uh, this goes like. Um, so this is the thing that gets raised to the 2.373 power. And this is a 1 over a squared. That means 1 over epsilon. So it's going like 1 over epsilon to this power. And that's the least favorable scaling with epsilon of all of these steps. Um, so in this case, it tells us how the number of gates that we need and the number of qubits scales with the error. Now I also have to worry about how things scale with the energy and and this also is a little disappointing. It's polynomial scaling so hooray uh, but it's not such a great polynomial. Uh, the number of gates that we need to do our simulation to some fixed accuracy uh, scales like en the total energy of the process to the sixth power. It turns out there's one power of energy from making the trotter error small. How big the trotter error is actually depends on how excited the fields can get, and that's controlled by the total energy in the process. And then there's a uh, factor of E squared, and that comes from the fact that uh, we need the lattice spacing to get smaller as the energy gets larger uh, in order to simulate very short wavelength excitation sufficiently accurately. So making the higher energy means smaller lattice spacing. That means more qubits in the computer. That means more gates. And then there's a factor of E cubed, which comes from the analysis of the diabatic error, the fact that uh, excitations can be created while we're turning the Hamiltonian on and off. And so this, uh, it's a little harder to explain why it's E cubed. Uh, I'll just say what goes into that analysis. 
There are two things that we have to worry about when we're turning the coupling on or off. Um, it could be that we excite particles out of the vacuum. Normally, particles wouldn't spontaneously appear, but if we're driving the system by changing the Hamiltonian as a function of time, there are processes in which the mass term in our Hamiltonian can create a pair of particles, or our interaction term can create four particles. And what's controlling how often that happens is the mass gap. So this is where it's really important that we're simulating a theory which has a non-zero mass. And um, there's another process that we have to worry about, which is particles can split. One particle can split into a three, uh, described by this interaction. If the particles were massless, that would actually be kinematically allowed. One particle can split into three particles, which are all moving in the same direction, whose momentum adds up to that of the original particle. So when we go to sufficiently high energy, this becomes uh, more and more of a problem. In the limit of energy very large compared to mass, this splitting can occur. There's some energy gap for that non-adiabatic process, but the gap actually goes away as the energy gets high. The gap uh, goes like uh, m squared over e. Uh, for large energy. So this actually turns out to be the more uh, vexing problem if we're studying the scaling with energy. And, and that's where this, it turns out, this E cubed comes from. So, um, so one can successfully show in this case of a scalar theory with an interaction and a mass gap that we can do the simulation with resources that scale polynomially, but they're not very nice polynomials. The scaling with both the uh, error and with the energy are not so good, so that raises the question of whether we can do much better. And in principle, we probably could do considerably better. Um, what we would need to, I mean, I, I should emphasize that although there's been some recent progress in improving how resources scale with the uh, Trotter error, that's not really our problem here. The problem is that we have this spatial lattice. And the problem is that we need to make the lattice spacing small in the units that are relevant to the physics that we're trying to simulate um, in order to have a small error. Small lattice spacing means more qubits and more gates. And so the way to make things better is to choose our Hamiltonian more cleverly. It's what Physicists would call a renormalization group improvement to the Hamiltonian. We would add additional terms which would allow us to simulate physics which looks like continuum physics without making the lattice spacing so small. But that isn't something that we've tried to systematically analyze to see how much we can improve the resource cost. Um, so let me just say, uh, I'm already over time, so quickly, some of the things that, some other things that we've done um, and some things that we uh, have not done. So we've uh, analyzed the simulation of fermionic theories. Uh, we've analyzed an alternative uh, algorithm, which has some advantages, in which instead of turning on the interaction when, um, after creating the wave packets, we turn on the interaction to create the vacuum of the interacting theory, and then excite particles by turning on time and spatially modulated sources. And that has a big advantage because there can be level crossings in the excited state spectrum that would cause a bad diabetic error if, for example, there are bound states in the theory which are stable particles, such a crossings occur. So if we really wanted to simulate a theory with bound states, we should do something different. And so there's an alternative that we've worked out. Uh, I mentioned BQP hardness and passing. That's something that we sort of have a strategy to show that the simulation problem is BQP hard, but we haven't worked out all the details. Uh, some other things which it's exactly, it's, it's not as clear uh, how to proceed, although we have rough ideas. Um, what about the case where we're trying to simulate a theory with massless particles? 
I think the key there is to get the physics right. You can't expect to, say, adiabatically turn on the interaction without creating lots of particles if there's no energy gap. But on the other hand, that can be relatively harmless if these are very soft, very long wavelength particles. And we could still get good simulations of the right physics questions to ask, which are what happens when you scatter two particles where each particle is surrounded by a cloud of very soft, massless particles, because that's what would really happen in a physics experiment. And I, another thing that we have only a vague idea about is simulating gauge theories, which is what one would really like to do to describe the fundamental particle physics in the real world. Um, and ultimately, I would like to understand whether it's possible to efficiently simulate quantum gravity, and there's sort of a, I mean, there's a strategy there, but it's a little bit more distant. I think it's, an, it's distant, but in a conceptually interesting way. I, I hope that, uh, you know, just like Wilson found an answer to the question, what is quantum field theory, by thinking about how to put quantum field theory on a computer, we can gain insight into what is string theory, what is quantum gravity, by thinking about how we would simulate it on a quantum computer. So that's the story for now. Thanks. Well, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I think in the case of the two dimensional, um, Two spatial dimension theory, where, you know, unlike, I don't want to talk about three spatial dimensions where in the continuum limit it's trivial, and in one spatial dimension it's, you know, less obvious about how hard it is. In two spatial dimensions, it's a super renormalizable theory, and so that has some nice features, but you still can't do perturbation theory in this strong coupling regime, even in the two spatial dimensions uh, theory. And uh, I mean, I don't think there are any known classical methods for studying the real time evolution of the theory in the strong coupling regime. And beyond that, I think that we should be able, by considering a suitable formulation of the problem, to uh, show that it's a BQP hard problem by simulating a quantum circuit through um, you know, particle interactions. Yeah. Yeah, so that's right. I would define it in a somewhat different way, but I would uh, consider this formulation of the problem. I would say, okay, let's prepare the vacuum, and now let's consider a um, Hamiltonian in which I turn on. Now I'm going to integrate over space time. So oh, then it's not a Hamiltonian. I guess I better not do that. Okay. I'll integrate over space, and then I'll have some uh, sources, which are classical, and some local operators, which are operators of the quantum field theory. So this is something classical that we can control, and this is uh, a quantum field theory operator. And so now the uh, resources will be, um, you know, have something to do with the, um, you know, the Fourier t composition of these classical sources, which corresponds to the energy and the scattering process that I occurred, that I, I described before, and the, the space-time volume that we want to simulate. And then in the end, again, we'll, we'll read out uh, values of some local operators. The task will be to, uh, you know, simulate accurately the probability distribution of those outcomes. And then in that setting, we can imagine encoding qubits, say, by using the sources to turn on potential wells in which we can hold particles, uh, in which we could do single qubit gates, say, by changing the height of one potential well compared to another, bringing two wells together, getting some 
phase shift to occur so we could do two qubit gates and uh, you know simulate some universal set of gates using the field theory in the case where we have time dependent classical sources that's the idea Was that a surprise, or was was that something you expected? Was what something I expected? You know, in terms of the diabetic error, you said there was there turned out to be this gap. How, how do you, in your analysis of the diabetic error, so was was that expected to be? Yeah, I don't really think there were any surprises in the story. Other, I mean, but when we started, I, we didn't know. You know exactly what scaling we would get, yeah. and I mean, this isn't some you know scaling with energy that. First of all, I have no particular reason to think that it's optimal, um, but until we did the analysis, we didn't know exactly what scaling to expect. Though we expected it to be polynomial. Yeah. So, hey. um, this is one way to simulate quantum fields. There are others. What about? I mean, things like the Amplitude graph that we hear about, and other things like that. Uh, what about what? Oh, sorry? these uh, Grassmann, the positive Grassmannian people talk about things like that, yeah. simulating amplitudes. Is that? Do you know how competitive that is with this? Right. So, uh, uh, so Adam's making reference to um, recent advances in uh, formulating quantum field theory in a, a new way, which makes it possible to, um, in a much more efficient way, uh, sum up all the contributions to perturbation theory in a given order. Um, but as far as, as far as I know, the complexity of doing such computations to uh, order n still scales super polynomially in n in that formulation. Uh, despite the dramatic improvements over previous methods. Uh, okay, so sorry to keep you uh, way past your lunch time. Not at all, it was a privilege to um, have John Preskill, one of the pillars of the field, cap off uh, the bootcamp.